OK, let's look at some pictures of gravity waves and how they're detected. And the videos and images in this video come from the LIGO website. We're going to look primarily at the LIGO detectors. These are two gravity wave detectors on opposite sides of the US. Everything here is very similar to the European one, the Virgo detector in Italy. But the particular movies I'm showing come from LIGO. So here's a simulation of gravity waves. We've got two compact objects, they might be black holes or neutron stars, and gravity waves are emitted when they accelerate, and so circular motion counts as an acceleration. Now as they orbit around each other, they radiate. As they radiate gravity waves, it carries energy away, which causes their orbits to spiral in, until eventually they merge, that sudden chirp, and produce that pulse of gravity waves. So that's what we're looking for. How do we look for it? Well, here's the fundamental a diagram, sh a movie showing the fundamental principle. We have a laser, which fires a beam at a beam splitter, which then flies off in both directions to two mirrors. So these are the two arms. So here's our wave coming out. It's split at the beam splitter. It goes, in the case of LIGO, four kilometers to one mirror, then bounces back, and four kilometers to the other mirror and bounces back. And then the combined light goes and hits a detector. So this is the fundamental principle of any sort of interferometer like this. Now you see if we move the relative positions of the mirrors, as if a gravity wave is coming through distorting space-time, it shifts the waves. And when the waves line up peak to peak, you get a strong signal. And when the peaks line up with the troughs, they are destructively interfering, get a zero signal. See strong signal, no zero, strong signal, no signal. That's the basic idea. What do these telescopes actually look like? Well, here's an aerial view of the uh, Livingstone, Louisiana Liv LIGO detector. And you can see it's a rather nondescript building with two very long pipes sticking out at right angles. And these are the vacuum pipes down which the laser beams go. Each, four, each arm is four kilometers long with a, a mirror hanging at the ends. This is inside one of the tubes during construction. And this is one of the mirrors that hangs at the end. Actually, this thing down at the bottom is the actual mirror. All the stuff above it is basically a procedure to hold this in place. It's suspended from four silica threads and a lot of this is just uh, um, designed to cancel out all the vibrations. You don't want people walking past to vibrate the floor, the wall, and make the whole thing shake. Uh, you don't want earthquakes or cars driving by or the tide or the wind or the trees being pushed back and forth by the wind. All these things can cause vibrations and this complicated superstructure is designed to cancel most of those out. Here's what that shed at the corner looks like inside. So you've got the, the pipes going off with the two different directions and lots of other pipes and vacuum chambers in which to store the mirrors and the detectors and the lasers and everything else. And here's what the control room looks like. This actually looks very much like the control room for modern optical telescopes. In fact, the control room for almost anything these days, which is lots of big computer monitors and screens and that's about it. Here is a schematic of the actual LIGO detector. So there's the two of them, Han Hanford and Livingston, opposite sides of the US. It's a bit more complicated than that diagram we saw before. You have the laser source putting out 20 watts. It's split into beams. And then each of the arms has a test mass mirror at both ends. And most of the light comes through and then just bounces back and forth between here. So even though you're only putting 20 watts in here, because it bounces backwards and forwards so many times, you get 100 kilowatts of circulating power. And you need that sort of power to get the sense incredible sensitivity we need. And then a small fraction of that is bled out, back down, and combined to the photodetector. And this diagram shows the strain noise. This is how sensitive you are. So strain is the percentage change, if you like. So it's one part in 10 to the minus 23 change. And you can see it's not so sensitive at frequencies of 20 hertz, gets more sensitive peak sensitivities of like 200 hertz frequency, and then the sensitivity decreases you at a higher frequency still. There are different sources of noise here, photon noise over here, shot noise over there, thermal noise in the middle. And there are also all these big spikes. 
at a particular frequencies where there's particularly bad noise. One of the most obvious ones is this one, which is at a frequency of 60 hertz. Now, if you live in the US, you might be able to figure out what that is. 60 hertz is the frequency of mains electricity in the United States. And that means you have huge amounts of equipment, all of which is having an alternating signal coming at 60 hertz frequency into it. That's powering your computers, your uh, transformers, the lights in the office buildings, all sorts of things. And so almost any piece of equipment, no matter how well shielded, is going to end up with a signal at 60 hertz. If you're in Australia, it would be at 50 hertz, because that's the frequency our mains electricity works at. You also get the harmonics of that, so you get a signal at 120 and 240 and so on going up the various integer ratios of this, and various other spikes. So what the people who work there spend a lot of their time doing is looking at these plots and desperately trying to work out exactly where this noise is coming from, where that noise is coming from, and suppress them all. But you can see that in between the spikes the noise levels are incredibly low.